Good evening. My name is Adam Paolazza. I'm a theater creator, an actor, and director, but I originally trained as a mime. However, I love talking about theater, uh, and so I'm very thankful to the Walrus for having me here tonight to talk about theater. Um, yeah, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here tonight. It really is a privilege. Um, so when the Walrus approached me to talk about the future of the arts, it's a lofty subject heading there, hashtag, whatever you want to call it, I started to think about my relationship to my own future and uh, how I kind of situate my work, my theatrical work in this context. And you know, several observations struck me, but the first observation, and it was actually pointed out by my father, and uh, he's sitting over there, when we were talking about politics, we don't always agree about that, but he said something to me that really struck me. He's like, oh, you, you're speaking from a place of fear. And I thought, you know, he's right. Whenever you mention the future, whenever I think of the future, I am very afraid of the future as I'm sure many of you can uh, empathize with. And why is that? Well, because of economic precarity. I'm afraid I won't have the financial wherewithal to uh, support myself in the future. Or if I have children, which is also something I'm afraid of, will I be able to support them? I'm afraid of the future of the planet. I'm afraid for the future of the oceans, for other species. I'm afraid that public discourse is becoming more and more polarized, that there's less tolerance, that there's less space for difference and for complexity. And I think this is something in art that we really need to work towards, art that can hold complexity, not offer easy answers. And I'm afraid that we're losing our capacity for empathy. And you know, feeling fear all the time is very exhausting. So, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been asking myself, how can I deviate some of this energy that I'm putting into this fear into something more useful? You know, something that could be useful to myself and to others, and how can the work that I make, you know, going forward in time emerge from this? So I started to think a little bit more about the nature of theater itself, about its special relationship to time. Theater doesn't engage with the future in the same way that other arts like painting or film do. It's ephemeral. Uh, it's an art of the present. It doesn't leave behind an artifact. And you know, this uniqueness of each performance of a theater, it creates a sense of urgency, you know, that feeling that if we look away, we, we might miss something. And um, I think that this requires both from the artists and the audience an, an enormous amount of attention to the present moment that we're in. Attending theater is an act of empathy. So on a practical level, I think this is great training for life, and especially for those like me who have a lot of anxiety and have difficulty being present to the present. And if that were all that theater did, I think that would be marvelous and wonderful, but I, I do believe that theater does more than that. Uh, perhaps I'm naive and a little bit utopic in my belief, but. But I, I do believe that theater can do more than that for us. And what can it do? Well, the kind of theater that I love and the kind of theater that I'm imagining in the future is a poetic theater. And I don't mean poetic in the sense of literature, but I mean it more in the, or the sense of the Greek verb poesis, which means to call into presence. Theater has the power to call into presence new visions of existence. It can offer striking new examples of how we can relate to each other, transforming the way that we derive meaning from experience. It challenges old modes of perception and encourages the development of new ones. And you know, the kind of theatrical visions that, that really inspire me, they do more than just reflect back a realistic image of the world. Because I think especially, you know, in Canada, I can't speak for everywhere in the world, but we definitely have a, a bias towards psychological naturalism. I think that comes from film, but I won't get on a soapbox about that. Um, so what I'm, what I'm more interested in is, it, it are visions that offer a critically informed aesthetic response to the world, that create a run in the fabric of our daily lives, an aesthetic tear in reality, where meaning and judgment are held in suspense. And I, I believe in this caesura that there is new space that can open up for critical thinking, you know, when we're confronted by the limits of our own understanding. And I think this is why, you know, in other times in history, theater has been persecuted by the state or by the church, and I think that's why, you know, in times like in political ter turmoil times, like uh, in the Czech Republic when the revolution was happening, there were still underground mime performances happening. And, and I think that, um, yeah, I think theater has this power. And, and I, have you ever had this kind of experience with a piece of art that sort of changed the way you understood things? I'll, I'll tell you one, I can remember the first one that I ever had. I was about 10 years old and I went to the Whitby Public Library with my mother, who's also in the audience, who also taught me how to read. Let's hear it from mothers. Um, and I discovered surrealism. So I saw a book of paintings that looked very unusual and I kind of picked it up and, and it blew my mind. 
completely. You know, I didn't know that you could look at the world that way, that you could place these seemingly ordinary, unrelated objects and figures to, together to create a sense of the marvelous. You know, and it opened up a whole new way for me to understand how an image could mean something, not just what it could mean. Because at the time, I didn't have critical language or intellectual experience to make sense of what I saw. But nevertheless, the affective force of these paintings, you know, they, they left me changed. I didn't see the world differently after that. And so I believe that this search for these new visions of existence that have the power to change us is the real task of artists in the present moving forward into the future. And I think that we need to approach the research and creation of these new theatrical visions you know, in a spirit of adventurous, collaborative, formal innovation, without fear of the unknown, without fear of failure. And I think that some of the critical discourse in the city, you know, the theater critics, they can help us by this. I think we're all on the same team. Let's get rid of this stupid star rating system. Let's, at, like, that show is terrible. That's why you should go see it, because it's going to help you learn something different. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, no more soapbox. But without fear of hard work, because it's going off into the unknown, right? Without fear of new artistic forms that challenge conventional means of theatrical representation. Because I think that we need new strategies for representation, new strategies for the body, new strategies for the voice, for text, for the image, for sexuality. And we need to create a dramaturgy that encourages us to critically reevaluate culturally accepted standards of value that have become so pervasive so as to be invisible. And I am the first to admit that I am still learning how to see these invisible, oppressive standards. And so I think, you know, new ways of seeing the world that requires not only new stories, but new ways of telling stories. And if we want to encourage our audiences to think and see and think about the world differently, we need to ask them to be critical not only of what they see, but how they see it. And I think that this is really the place where art and ethics, where aesthetics and ethics intersect. Um, I think this is why the uh, Italian Marxist thinker, that's right, he's a leftist Marxist thinker. He's part of the conspiracy that's uh, rampant in universities. Uh, Paolo Virno, I think he, this is why he situates the avant-garde movements of the past, you know, as problematic as they can be, close to progressive social movements, as they both point out, quote, the inadequacy, the disproportion of the old standards. Uh, Virno goes on to say, quote, it's about new rules. The collapse of old rules and anticipating new rules, even if only formal, is where aesthetics and social resistance meet. This is a common ground where a new society is anticipated, end quote. And this is where I see a, a real tangible effect that theater can have on mitigating our fear of the future. It's almost as if theater teaches us to be better prepared by the future by attending more closely to the present moment, to the here and now. It's happening now and now and now. And now I fear that my seven minutes have come and gone, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you.